Here we go. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house, you guys. Come on. We are beginning a brand new series today simply called The Book of Ephesians, which is really a letter, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, this is kind of a change of pace series here at Discovery. If you've been here for a few weeks or a few months, I like to employ a lot of different methods of teaching the Bible here. So, so we'll do like all of it's biblical, all of it's scriptural and, and biblically based, but the method that is used... I like to change it up on you guys so you can get different variety of teachings and styles to learn and grow in the Word of God. So we might do like character studies. There might be series that we do, like the one we just went into. Actually, the one we're coming out of, the Holy Spirit, was a character study on the person of the Holy Spirit. So we've done a lot of different variety of persons and characters throughout the Bible and studied them. Uh, we've done like sections of the Bible. Uh, we've done topical messages, which was Jesus' most popular method of teaching was topically. So we'll do that as well. Uh, and then we'll do series like this, which is a entire book of the Bible where we just dissect it verse by verse going through. And as we do this, you're going to see how practical and powerful the Word of God is. Like, it's not scary. It's not something that some people are convinced they can't understand it. We can't know it. It's too much for us. So someone else has got to teach us. In fact, man, I, yes, I've done, guys, I did a lot of research for this series. I've probably read about six different commentaries, Bible studies, been studying for months to deliver you some, uh, the Word of God. But I don't want you to just be spoon-fed here. I want you to bring your Bible yourself to church, amen? So this is one of the series, like, and I know I, I make you guys lazy because I give it all to you. I give you a handout, and here's the notes, and here's the scriptures, and which is great. I'm glad, like, we do that so you can follow along. I want you to use those things, but this is a series I want you to actually bring your Bible too. So if you have a Bible, I want you to bring your Bible. I want to see you like thumbing through, like, like, like I want to hear the, the old school pages turn in. You know what I'm talking about? Like, just like, where, where's Ephesians at? Where did that go? I want you to see it. And if you have a study Bible, bring the study Bible, because I don't want to do all the studying up in here. Amen. I want you to know and study the Word of God yourself so you can get rhema as God is speaking to you through, through me. He's going to speak to you through your Word. Amen? Okay? So bring it. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible. If you, don't, if you can't get a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. Let us know after the service. We'll get you a Bible if you can't want, get one. If you can get one, I'd encourage you to get a study Bible. I encourage, this one here is a New King James Version study, the Nelson Study Bible. I got dozens of study Bibles. They're all great. If you're looking for one, like what's, what's a good starter one? The NIV Life Application Study Bible is a great starter study. It's a really good Bible. Grab that. I'm going to be teaching a lot in NIV. Uh, that's going to be primary, the primary scriptures, although you'll see a lot of different translations that I'll use to bring the Word of God to you. Um, I, I I, I want you to learn through Ephesians and grow through Ephesians in this series, but primarily, honestly, what I want you to, what, what I want to get out of this for you in this series, I want you to love your word. I want you to love your Bible. I want you to like fall in love with it, to, to desire the word of God for yourself. And so we're going to study it. I'm gonna, it's going to be practical. It's going to be powerful. And in this series as well, what I'll do is I'll try to connect some dots for you to enrich your your kind of Bible reading experience. So when you read it, things are coming alive differently to you. In fact, let me kind of explain one of them. Let me connect a dot for you because last week we were actually studying about Ephesians and you may not have uh, even known it. In the, in the series of the Holy Spirit, we were reading in Acts chapter 19 where Paul came, up, came upon these disciples and he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed. And they go, we haven't even heard about a Holy Spirit. I just taught on this. And he said, no, you guys, you guys need to know. That was actually in Ephesus. That was in Ephesus. They were disciples who had been baptized in John's baptism and had become part of the Jesus movement, but they missed out on the, on the impartation and, and, and the, the, the Holy Spirit. And so the apostle Paul teaches them that, lays hands on them. They get baptized in the Spirit, but Paul stays there for several years in Ephesus. 
And he's teaching and preaching and raising leaders and disciples. And, and, and a church gets started there in Ephesus before he leaves to go do more work for God. Let me kind of set up where we're going today, uh, give you some overview of Ephesians, and then we'll jump into our first part here. Let me give you the purpose. It's not in your notes. But Paul's purpose, Paul's the author of this book, and his whole purpose for writing is this. He wanted to help God's people embrace their new identity and their new purpose in Christ. That's the whole purpose of what we're going to be studying. It's the context of the letter he's writing. He wants God's people, he wants you and me to embrace, to understand and embrace the new identity we have in Christ and to walk out the new purpose we have in Christ. In fact, that's actually the sections of the, the letter. The first three chapters are about our identity and purpose in Christ. And then the last three chapters are about our purpose and practice on this earth. Let me show you where we're going in this six-week series. It's going to be six weeks. I'll show you just where we're going, and we'll jump into part one today. Part one today is about our new life in Christ, like what a blessing that is and how to live out our new life in Christ. Next week, we'll talk about the new family that God has given us. We, we, we've got a new family now called the church. Amen. Somebody, he wants us to know that. What is this new family? We have a new mission God has given us. We have new rules for living, the rules of your life that you used to live by, that you used to dictate your life, those rules are obsolete now. And he's going to go into detail looking at, hey, what you used to live by, here's the new rules of the kingdom of heaven that we are now going to live by. Then there's new relationships. Because you're in Christ, your relationship should look different. Your marriage relationships, your home relationships with your kids, your boss, your, your leader, and you have, you have people you're serving and leading. All that looks different. We have new relationships and standards of relationships in Christ. And then we're going to end in chapter 6 with the new enemy that we have to face in Satan and his demonic forces. This is the structure that we'll go through, and I'm so excited to study the Word of God with you. How many are ready to get into the Word of God today? Amen. Okay, let me hear those pages turn it. No, I'm just kidding. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1, and then let me just kind of pause for a moment, even just after this first line. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus. Let me time out right here and just kind of give you context. Context is important when you're studying like a book of the Bible and sections of the Bible. The Apostle Paul is the author. He's writing this at around AD 60, AD 62. So it's around 30 years after Jesus rose from the grave. It's probably around, you know, five years, anywhere from three to five years from where, when he left Ephesus and he installed a few people you'll see in the Bible, Priscilla and Aquila in the book of Acts. You'll see those names. Those are leaders he installed in Ephesus. There's actually another book called Timothy, First and Second Timothy. That's another pastor he installed in Ephesus that he was writing to. So just trying to connect some dots for you guys. This is the Apostle Paul writing to this church he started in Ephesus. He's been gone for a few years now, and he wants them to embrace new identity, new purpose, new life in Christ, and then to walk out that life in Christ. Ephesus was a strategic target for the Apostle Paul, though, because it was one of the um, one of the largest cities in, uh, of like trade and commerce. It was like a very important city to Rome. Um, everyone had to travel through there. Uh, they had to worship in there. In, in fact, they, there was a primary idol that they worship, a false god, a deity by the name of Diana. In, in the temple of Diana was actually stationed in Ephesus. And I want to show you, i got some pictures up here of Diana in ruins, the, the, the temple of Diana in ruins. And then this is what the temple of Diana would have looked like in its like heyday, in its prime, in Ephesus. The temple of Diana, some cultures call it the temple of Artemis. It's the same demon god that they would worship, the temple of Diana. This, this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was one of the seven ancient structures that people from all over the world would come and see. They would come and worship this goddess Diana. And part of the worship practice was temple prostitution. And, and so this was a very idolatrous, wicked place full of um, lots of wealth, lots of pro prosperity, but a, a lot of idol worship. So the Apostle Paul plants a church in this place, and many people are coming to know Christ, but they're coming out of a very I idol worship, different culture, lifestyle that he's trying to let them know now what does a new life in Christ look like? Okay, let me go back to our scripture. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, 
by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in verse 3 begins what's called a, 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 a baraka, is what it's called. It, he's, he writes a praise. It's a psalm of praise is what he writes. And in the Greek, it's one run-on sentence for 10 verses. The next 10 verses is one run-on sentence of praise and adoration that Paul writes to God. He begins, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, it's really important to note here what, what Paul is saying, that the blessings that we have are in Christ. And he will say that and repeat that. In our study today of for Ephesians chapter 1, you're going to see in Christ, in him, through him. This is an important context to all the blessings that we have because contrary to many of the books that you've read and movies and seminars, you're not going to discover life's meaning by looking into yourself. You probably already tried that. You didn't create yourself, so there's no way that you can tell yourself what you were created for. In Christ, you are loved completely. In Christ, your past doesn't define you. In Christ, you have access to the plan that God has for your life. It's important that we first know who we are in Christ so that we can find out our purpose. So we don't do things to earn anything from God because he accepts us completely. Amen, somebody? But Paul is going to now, after verse 3, he, in this praise, he gives us four blessings that we have in Christ. And I'm going to share those with you first. The four blessings that we have in Christ. And then he's going to share with us the four things that through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we would live out our new life in Christ in four ways. That's, that, that's what we're going to study today. The four blessings he shares with us. And then the four ways we live out this new life through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Am y'all ready for it, you guys? Amen? Okay, here's the blessings that we have in Christ that the Apostle Paul mentions to us. Number one is this. We are chosen by God. We are chosen by God. Every person wants three things in life. Every human being, we want love, we want acceptance, and we want to be chosen. Every person wants those things. Everyone in this room wants those things. Even those of you that are unwilling to admit it today, you want those things, whether you want to admit it or not. You want to be accepted. You want to be loved. You want to feel chosen. Ephesians chapter 1 continues in verse 4 and 5, and it says, For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. Everybody wants to be chosen, from your childhood playground days to your workplace uh, to even your love life. You want to be chosen in a relationship. You want somebody to pick you and to choose you. Listen to me, church. God likes you. It may, not, it may seem like others don't like you at times. Sometimes you don't even like you, but you need to know God likes you, and he completely accepts you. In fact, more than that, God loves you. God, his acceptance isn't based on your performance. It's not based on anything you do. It's, it's based on who he is and what he did, what Jesus did. There's a word used here that can be confusing, though, in chapter 5, or ch verse 5. It might cause some of us to develop some false theories about life and maybe even throw around a word called fate, destiny. Very, and not really knowing what even we're saying when we say that. It, because it says we are predestined, that he has predestined us. What does that mean that God predestines us? In fact, in verse 11, it says he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. So, so some people read verses like this and they go, well, if God is working out everything according to his plan and he's making it work out and he predestines us, well, then what part do like... Do we have, is he writing it all then? Do we have any part to play in this? Uh, here's, here's what's very clear, though. You, he chose you. You didn't choose him. Okay? okay? John chapter 15, verse 16 says this. Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. God chose. In fact, some of you are in here at church today, and you, like, a few years ago, you're, you're, you would probably not believe that you'd be in church today and actually liking it. You're like, well, I didn't know I'd ever be here. Well, how'd that happen? Because God chose you. 
That's what happened. He changed your heart. He started shifting things that you started like desiring to get closer to him and to hear him. God chose you. You didn't choose him. And Jesus called disciples. They didn't, they didn't call him. Jesus went and found them and called them to himself. But they weren't the only people Jesus called. And not everybody chose to follow him back, did they? And remember in Mark chapter 10, Jesus calls this rich young ruler to follow him. And this guy chose not to follow. He rejected Jesus because he could not walk away from his riches. So this kind of, this, this thought of predestination and God writing a story according to his plan, it's really the tension between God's sovereign will and human free will. And I'd like to just take a little bit of time and explain here the, the difference. And, and, and it's not the subject of why Paul is writing, but I think it's important for us to understand the difference here. Because some people believe, actually some well-intentioned believers and theologians and pastors will teach God's sovereign will, he controls it all, predestines it all, and you have not so free will. He's the one who actually predestines you. And so that means he predestines some of you to accept him and love him and follow him and experience eternal life with him in heaven. And some of the people he created, he destined for them to not love him and not accept him. And they're going to go to hell. And that's part of God's plan. And that was his sovereign will because it's he's the one who's writing the entire story. I just don't see that biblically, you guys. And I'm going to help you see that. Uh, just kind of give you some extra scriptures here that's not in your notes as how we should think about God's sovereign will and human free will. Let me give you some extra verses. Romans chapter 8, 29 says this. For those God foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So we see the foreknowledge of God operating here. God already knew in advance, and so he predestined. Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah, I knew you. And before you were even born, I set you apart, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What is very clear in the scripture is that God is sovereign. We know that. He is in control. He sits above the cosmos. He is eternal, meaning God is timeless, that he exists in the eternal presence, which, which means this. He is experiencing all of time simultaneously. Like, you guys, this, this idea of, like, God's sovereign will and human free will, it's one of those things that will put your mind in a pretzel because your mind cannot comprehend the mind of God, the omnipotence of God, the omnipresence of God. There is just, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. So far above the heavens and the earth, we cannot fathom the sovereignty of God. We can't. But what is very clear is that God has sovereignty, but he has delegated and empowered you with freedom. He is that both of these things, God's sovereign will and human free will, somehow work together in the story God is writing, that he is sovereign, sitting above time, and has given you freedom and choice. First Timothy chapter 2 says it like this, that this is good and pleases God our Savior. Look what he wants. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, if that's what God wants, if he wants everyone to be saved... Then why doesn't he just write the story? He's predestined in any way. If that's what he wants, write it down. Why write that some people aren't going to be saved if that's what you want, God? That's because God has given you a choice. He's given you a choice. We know the choice. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Here's the choice, that whoever believes in him, and that's your choice, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Your choice, my choice, is to believe on him, to follow him, or to reject him. There's actually a scripture I found that has both of these qualities, God's sovereign will and human free will operating simultaneously in salvation. Let me show it to you. I found this scripture. Acts 13, 48 says this, that when the Gentiles heard the gospel, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. They honored God's word when they heard it. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Well, so the question is, well, were they appointed to, to an eternal life and believed because they honored the word of God? Or did they honor the word of God because they were appointed to eternal life? Hmm. The answer, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. 
God, God is sovereign. He sits above time and knows your choice before you ever made it, yet gives it to you anyway. In fact, that, Deuteronomy 30, 19 underscores this truth. God says, this day, I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you a choice. Here's the choice. I'm calling all the heavenly hosts, all of my angels, every, all created heavenly beings. I'm putting them before you. Here's the choice I'm giving you, life and death, blessings and curses. And then he pleads with us. If you read this in Hebrew, this is a plead of God. Now please choose life so that you and your children may live. God wants you to choose. So the question isn't, did he choose you? Because he did, he chose you. The question is, do you choose him? You choose him because he's already chosen you. He's chosen you. He chose you. He loves you. But are you going to choose him? Are you going to choose life or death? You are chosen by God. What a blessing that Paul says you are chosen. You didn't even choose him. He chose you. Okay, that's the first blessing. (laughs) Okay, let's continue because all the rest, all the rest flow from this though, flow from this idea that you are chosen by God. The rest of the blessings come from this idea of being chosen by God. Let me show you the second blessing Paul says we have in Christ and that is, write it down like this, we are adopted as God's children. In fact, God created the entire universe because he wanted A family. The whole reason the universe exists is because God wanted to create children to love. Let me show you. Verse 5. God destined us to be adopted children through Jesus Christ. There's the key again. Through Jesus Christ because of his love. And this was according to the good will, his good will and plan. According to this verse, when did God choose you? He chose you before the world was ever made. What a thought, you guys. Before God chose a tree, he chose you. Before he chose the oceans, he chose you. Before he chose a rock, he chose you. Think about it. Before God chose and created the sun, the moon, the stars, the expanse, and the universe, God thought of you, chose you, and created this cosmos for you. What, what a thought, all so that we could be part of the family of God, chosen and adopted and loved by God. Romans 8, 15 says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I used to play a game with my kids when they were young, and I'd ask them, why does daddy love you? And I'd, and I'd ask them this when they, when they made a mistake or when they failed, and I'd ask them when they made uh, something good happen or they won a game or they achieved something, and I'd ask them. And I, what I was trying to do is get them to drill down really why daddy loves them because it started out with, I don't know, because I, I messed up, or started out with like, because I'm first place and because I, I did it, because I, I won. And, but when they got older, they got to the real answer as I led them through. Like, no, nope, that's not why daddy loves you. No, actually, that's not why. You know why daddy loves you? Because you're my child. That's why I love you. Because you're my girl. That's why I love you. Because you're my boy. That's why daddy loves you. So now they know the answer to that question, no matter what. Hey, why does daddy love you? Because we're your kid, dad. You know why God loves you? This is why God loves you. Because you're his son. That's why. Because you're his daughter. That's why. It's not about your performance. It's not about what you did or don't do. Because you are a child of God, you are loved by God. This is the blessing we have in Christ. You are chosen. You are adopted into his family. Here's the third blessing. We are redeemed and forgiven. Regardless of the height and the breadth and the depth of your sins before coming to Christ, once in Christ, you are redeemed and forgiven. The prophet Isaiah says, though your sins be as red as scarlet or crimson, they'll be purified white as snow. Verse 7 of Ephesians, Paul says, in him, again, here's all the key, it's in him. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of of God's grace. First, let's unpack this concept of redemption. Biblically, redemption refers to the act of buying back or paying a ransom to set someone free. In ancient times, this term was often used for someone in slavery or captivity. Like if someone was enslaved or or held captive, they could be redeemed 
by a payment of a ransom, which would set them free from their bondage. So in a spiritual sense, redemption means that Christ has paid the price to set us free from the bondage of our sin and death. And this payment was paid in full by a sacrificial death on the cross and the blood that was shed. Can I get an amen, somebody? You are redeemed. But the second part of this blessing is so good because you're not just redeemed. He says, you are forgiven. Forgiveness is the release of the guilt and the penalty of sin. So check this out. Not only are, are, is the debt paid, but all the penalties and the personal guilt of your sin is gone in Christ. That's a lot better than your respondent. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Christ, our sins are not only forgiven, they're also forgotten. They are removed from us. They are never counted against us. This forgiveness isn't something that we can earn. It's not something that we deserve. Ephesians says that it's in accordance with the riches of God's grace. It's his grace. It is a gift. It is the unmerited favor of God. And this grace of God is so abundant, so overflowing. It makes his forgiveness complete and irrevocable. It means that through Christ, we're not only set free from sin's power, but also um, set free from the stain of sin because of his grace. Okay, that didn't excite you very much, but if that, if that doesn't get you excited and fill you with gratitude and worship, listen, if God's grace has become unremarkable to you, it's probably because your sin has become ordinary to you. If you're not in awe of his grace anymore, grace is only amazing because it saved a wretch like me, somebody. Like this is a blessing we have in Christ that Paul is reminding you today. God is reminding you of the amazing blessing that the debt is paid and all the penalties and all of the guilt is washed away in Christ. What a blessing that we have to be chosen, to be op adopted, to be redeemed and forgiven. And then the fourth blessing is that we have an inheritance inheritance in Christ. We're chosen to be part of his family. And as his children, that means we are heirs to all that belongs to him. Verse 11, we have also received an inheritance in Christ. We were destined by the plan of God who accomplishes everything according to his design. So what does it mean to have an inheritance? In earthly terms, an inheritance is something that's passed down from one generation to the next, and it's often in that form of wealth or property or some valuable possessions of some kind. But spiritually, our inheritance in Christ is so much more valuable than any earthly inheritance. Our spiritual inheritance is our eternal life. It's the fullness of joy. It's the, it's the joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's the peace that surpasses understanding. It's the presence of God forever. And no matter what happens in this life, that inheritance is waiting for us. See, your earthly inheritance can fade, it can be wasted, it can be lost, but your eternal inheritance in Christ does not fade, it does not decay, it remains for you. We have an inheritance in Christ. Paul turns the corner after he explains the blessings we have in Christ, and then he prays, he prays, he goes from pray, praise to prayer, and he prays for the church to live out their new life in Christ through the spirit of wisdom and revelation in four ways. Let me give you, and this is just, I'm just giving you the Bible, okay? That's all I'm doing in this series, is just giving you the Bible, y'all, teaching you the word of God. There's four things that Paul says, you want to live out your new life in Christ? You need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. But there's four things he wants you to live out. Number one is this. We, we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God. Write it down like this, better and better, Okay, I want you to write it down, better and better, because that's actually what Paul, in the Greek, when you look at it, that's what it means. It means better and better, because some people know of God, some people know about God, but very few people know God. How many know what I'm talking about here, okay? This isn't just an intellectual pursuit, it's a deep personal relationship that transform every aspect of your life. This is experiencing his presence, understanding his will, and growing in our relationship with him. Let's look at it, verse 17. He says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here's the first thing, for the first thing that the spirit of wisdom and revelation that he's asking it to be imparted to us. 
that you may know God better. That you can know God. Now this, is, this stands in a stark contrast to the idol worship that they're used to. The old life that they're used to in worshiping maybe a goddess like Diana. The only time that you would worship these idols was to appease them, to not get on their bad side, or maybe to get some favor. But worship of Yahweh through Yeshua, the worship of the one true God through Jesus is not to appease, it's not to get on his good side, but to have a relationship with him. You can know your God better and better. And Paul prays for the Ephesians that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation to have a deep and intimate relationship with God. Jeremiah 9, 24, God says, let the one who boasts Boast about this, not how much they have, how much they know, what they've earned. Nope, that they have understanding to know me, that I am the Lord. You can know God. And here's what, here's what the Apostle Paul is praying in our new life. He says, you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better and better. Let me ask you a question. Do you know God better than you did last year? Not, not know about God better, but do you know God better? Okay, like are you grow, or do you know the heart of God, the character of God? Is the spirit of wisdom and revelation being imparted into you where the Holy Spirit is downloading to you rhema and revelation about who God is and how he wants to operate and reveal his will in your life? Do you know God better and better? Because this is the new life that God has called and made available to you. You can know God better and better through the spirit of wisdom. And revelation. The second thing that the Apostle Paul says, through the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you can know your calling. To know your calling. Now, knowing your calling starts with knowing who God is and trusting who he says you are. Look at verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. See, when you recognize that you are called by God and you are chosen by God, your life is not your own. You're going to live differently as ambassadors of Christ. You're going to walk around with the eyes of your heart enlightened, and you're going to see things differently. Your problems won't be just problems anymore. They're divine assignments for God to reveal himself. There's a couple things about your calling that we need to know, though. Here's the first thing. The size of your assignment does not determine the significance of your impact. The size of the assignment God has for you does not determine the significance of your impact. There are all kinds of assignments every day that God is trying to get you. He's trying to get to you. But calling is as much who you're becoming as it is what you're doing. It's not just what I'm called to do, but who I'm called to become. See, a lot of times when we think of calling, we always think of the doing. What am I supposed to do? But when Paul is talking about the hope of your calling, he's not referencing a doing as much as he is referencing a being. That you are becoming. 2 Timothy 1.9 says that he has saved us and called us to a holy life. And not because of anything we've done. Like we didn't earn this or deserve this, but because he's of his own purpose, and there's that word again, of his own grace. He, I didn't choose him. He chose me. He called me. And, and the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us, you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can know the calling of God on your life. What he's called you to do and who he's called you to become. See, a lot of people, they look at my life and they're like, well, he's, you're called to preach. You're you're called to preach. Yes, I get that. But more than being called to preach, I'm called to live a holy life. Okay? So, So yes, I'm called to be a pastor. That's my due. But I am first called to be a son of God. That's my who. And if you don't get the who right, your due ain't gonna matter. I have discovered that you don't need to actually find your calling. When you become who God has called you to be, you don't have to find your calling. Your calling will find you. Okay, so, so... We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation operating in our life to know God better and and better, to to know our calling. And then number three, to know God's riches. To know God's riches. Now, I wrote it down like this, and I kind of struggle with this because um, do you know what God's riches are? Do you know what God's riches is? God's riches, according to the word of God, is you. It's, It's his people. 
It's his church. And the Apostle Paul says, I, I want you to get this because you're not just this individual on an individual journey, worshiping a false deity for your own wealth and prosperity and happiness. And, and no, that's that you are not an individual. You are part of a family and a community. You are the riches of God's, of, of God's holy people. Look what he says in verse 18. It says, the riches, I want you to know the riches of his glorious inheritance, and this is different from the inheritance we receive from God. He says the inheritance in his holy people. When Paul speaks about this riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, he's highlighting that we, as believers, are viewed as the precious possessions of Christ. Just as an inheritance has treasured value, so we are to God. We're not just random creations. We are cherished. We are considered valuable, immensely valuable to God. The idea is that Christ considers the church, his people, his treasured possession. And the apostle Paul is specifically praying for these new believers in Ephesus, and he's trying to get us today a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you are not this individualistic child of God walking out your own divine purpose, trying to appease out God and work out your own calling and get, get on his good side. You are part of his inheritance of his people, the church. And you need a spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand you're not just one unit, you are a collective unit. We are an inheritance. And just as the inheritance reflects the legacy of the one who gives it, this, we are called to reflect the character and the glory of God as the legacy and the riches of his glory. So, so here's what we need to know. We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation so we know God better and better. And we're growing not just up knowing about God, but we're growing closer to God. And we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation operating to know our calling and not just the assignment of what we're called to do, but who we're called to become. And we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation operating in our lives so we know the riches of the holy people that God has called us into. And then number four, we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God's power that is at work within us. It's the same power that God raised Jesus from the dead. It's available to you, the Bible says. What an amazing God that we have. A God that shares his power with us, that shares his authority with us. Again, this is like different from the gods, that the pagan gods that they would worship. These gods like Diana and others, they held all power. They held all authority. You are nothing and you need to come to me who has this God who has all power. Our God says, not only do I have all power, but I give all power to you. Not only do I have all authority, but I'm giving my authority to you. There is a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we need to understand what great power God has delegated to you as his people in Christ, the children of God. Verse 19 and 20. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. This power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. What a God we serve. See, you've, if you feel dead in some areas of your life, you don't need to stay dead. You know why? Because God has resurrection power available for you. If you feel stuck in an area of your life, you don't need to stay stuck. I mean, think about it. If God can get Jesus unstuck from the grave and death, he can surely get you unstuck from your situation. Maybe you need a resurrection. Maybe you need a resurrection in your energy. You need a resurrection in your marriage. You need a resurrection in your dream. Humans can resuscitate, but only God can resurrect. Your dead energy, your dead marriage, your dead dreams can be resurrected, not by your own power, but by the power of God. See, by our own power, our own strength, it's not enough. It's not. But that's actually, that's actually where God's power is greatest is when you realize that you're not strong enough. Let me show it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Paul says... But he said to me, let me time out here for just a moment, because this is, this is actually in a moment of weakness for Paul, in a moment of crisis and despair. The apostle Paul is praying, God, help me, take this from me. It's actually, but th this is a moment where the apostle Paul is getting wisdom and revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is operating in Paul. He's getting an impartation of the Holy Spirit in the moment of his need. 
So in the moment of his need, God speaks to him, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and God tells him, hey, Paul, here it is again, my grace, my grace is what you need. My grace is sufficient for you. That thing that be has become unremarkable to you, the thing that you just don't get excited about anymore, that you don't cry about, that he saved a wretch like you, that thing, listen to me, if, if if that grace is unremarkable to you, because a lot of you think that's what grace is. Grace is just this mercy of God. It's like he didn't give me what I you know, deserve. No, grace is the empowerment of God to get you through what you can't get through on your own. And if you don't, if it's become unremarkable to you, the grace of God that has redeemed and forgiven you, then in the moment of your crisis, in the moment of your pain, in the moment of your trial, you're not going to have the power of God to get you through. Because the same grace that bought you is the grace that keeps you. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul gets a revelation from God, and he says, therefore, I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. When we fail to remember that grace empowers us to go beyond our natural ability, we're going to be prone to strive to be holy in our own ability, and that's not possible. It's the grace of God that saved you. It's the grace of God that keeps you. Some of us have forgotten that. Some of us have forgotten the, the blessing that we have in Christ. And your relationship with God has become commonplace. Others of you, you, even, you sense even right now God choosing you. Like he's chosen you. But the question is, are you going to choose him? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.